Hey everyone, welcome. Three weeks ago, I did a video about my DL3ADE from HP, the main server in my network. This is my Unraid server, and I run several Dockers on my server, um, as well as virtual machines. So it must be a powerful server. And I came to the conclusion that, well, for virtualization, that isn't the case at the moment. Before this DL3 AD, I was using the Threadripper you see behind me as a server and before that the Ryzen 7 2700X. And those two were performing way better regarding the virtualization than the DL3 ADE did. So um, in that video we tested the NVMe SSD you see in the background, the RAID 0 configuration, it's the Western Digital AN1500, a 1TB SSD actually 2 times 500 gigabytes in a RAID 0 configuration. Very fast SSD, but it didn't change anything regarding the performance of my server. So I quickly took that SSD out of the server, put it in my workstation, and it will probably stay in my workstation because it didn't have any performance improvements for my DL380. In that video, I was also talking about the different changes I made to my virtual machines to get it running better. Uh, it was running better with Windows Server 2019 um, than it was with the Windows 10 virtual machines. Try different versions from 1903 up to 20H2 and that didn't matter. Next to Unraid, I also created a test setup on the same server with a couple of hard drives and SSDs. Run ESXi 7.0 on that, created the data store for data, a data store on the SSDs for Windows. I uh, did a couple of tests with that and that was working pretty good. Not as fast as my older host, uh, which have the X5690 CPUs and some other ones from that lineup. Uh, those are performing better. They have a higher core clock. The CPUs that I used in the server were the Xeon E5 2450L CPUs. Uh, those have a base clock of 1.8 GHz with a turbo boost of up to 2.3. And some of you in the comment section um, were mentioning that probably the core clock of these CPUs uh, were too low to get a decent performance for virtualization. That were these CPUs you see here, uh, both of them, because I replaced them. Now I already recorded a video about swapping out the CPUs in this server. Uh, therefore, you will need to do a firmware flash uh, so the server will actually recognize the newer type of CPUs that you want to install in your server. In my case, those are uh, 2470 V2 CPUs. And I just wanted to edit that video and then I realized that I forgot to record the audio on that video. So yeah, the positive thing about that is you won't hear me rambling for half an hour. We can shorten things out for that. I recorded some footage uh, with my iPhone and that will have uh, audio on it. And that was the part about actually swapping out the CPU. So as I mentioned, I replaced these two with Xeon's E5 2470 uh, V2 CPUs. Those CPUs have a base clock of 2.4 gigahertz with a turbo boost of up to 3.2. So in theory, that would probably mean that they will consume more power. And we will get to that uh, by the end of this video, uh, if that's actually the case. Because the older CPUs were 8 cores, 16 threads. The new uh, CPUs are 10 cores, uh, 20 threads. And that will give me a total amount of 20 cores and 40 threads. So a lot of power for my home server. Really nice. Now, when you first attempt to upgrade the CPUs yourself on the server, you will have to do the firmware flash. You will have to let this server know that the V2 CPUs are actually compatible with that model. And I will put the link you see in the background now in the video description, so it's easy for you to find it. You can also download the firmware there. Now there are several ways to install the firmware. Uh, what you see in the background is Rufus, and with this tool you can create a bootable USB stick with an ISO file. What you see is a 8 gigabyte USB stick. Um, I named it WipeMe because the USB stick will be erased, so uh, make sure you have no important data on that. Then we have boot selection, and here we can select our ISO file. That will be this file. I just download it, double click on that, uh, give it a volume label if you want, file system FAT32 and click on start. This will give you a warning that the ISO image seems to use an obsolete version of Avisa Manu C32. Just click on yes and it will download the file if you want to. Then we get the message warning, all data on the device will be erased, destroyed. Okay, that's fine, nothing important on there. And it will create the bootable USB stick for you. HP also has a HP USB key.exe in their ISO file. Right click on your ISO file, open with Explorer, 
it will just mount it as a virtual CD drive. Then you see a folder called USB. Within that folder we have a folder called HP USB key. And here you can find an executable uh, which is called HP USB key. Now if we run this as administrator on Windows 10 we get this message. So I suggest to keep things easy use uh, something like Rufus to create your USB. A bootable USB drive if you want to use that to boot your server with. Then there is another option and that's the option I went with and I found that uh, to be the easiest way to do this. Just launch a remote console session, mount the ISO as a virtual image within the remote console session, restart your server, boot from the virtual CD drive and it will launch the firmware upgrade process. The first time I recorded that um, I was recording the wrong screen. So probably everything that could go wrong with this video went wrong. So once I found out that I didn't record my screen while flashing this firmware, I decided to just repeat the process and see what it did. It actually um, uh, flashed it again, only this time it didn't take as long because the firmware was already installed. But it gives you a good indication of how this process works. It's a fully automated process. The only thing you have to do is press enter, flash it, reboot the server and um, in my case the server was actually powered down when it was done. The second time it just rebooted it, started unraid from the USB drive, so I had to power it down. And so we came to the process of actually upgrading the CPUs. Now these original CPUs, the 2450Ls, have a nice uh, blue plastic bracket on them, which makes it easy to install. You can just slide it in, install the CPU, install the heatsink on top of that, and then you are done. The new CPUs I got didn't have a bracket. Um, I thought about of swapping out these. These are glued onto the CPU and I found out, well, I can just install it carefully. Just make sure you have the CPU aligned properly before proceeding with installation of the heatsink again. Now, um, let's have a look on the footage of that now. So yeah, here we have my server and let's get this off. Yes. Now below these two heat sinks are the 2450Ls and yeah, we're gonna replace them with the 2470. Now it is a bit of a challenge with one hand to be honest. First we're gonna and this one, then that one. This one, not all the way. Well, like that, yes, we can take this one right off. And there is our CPU. Yeah. Nice. Now, these CPUs have two levers to hold the CPU in place. And if we pull this, you can see here we have our CPU. These CPUs have this bracket on them. And yeah, it's, it's quite helpful for installing CPUs like this. But I'm not going to use any of that with my new CPUs. With my new CPUs, we're just gonna install it like this. Just like that. It's a bit of a challenge with one hand and it's in place. So the ISS is very clean now. And the same goes for our heatsink. This is actually cryonaut and yeah, it's what I use for all my systems. So yeah, why not on this server? So we're gonna apply a little bit of that and then we're gonna install the heatsink. Now this will probably raise a lot of questions, but yeah, I don't have a method of applying thermal compound to a CPU. No, not really. It will spread out and it will actually cool our CPU and that's what matters, right? And the last one. So, this CPU is done. Actually, it was the second CPU. That is the first CPU. So, um, now we're gonna do the same with the second CPU. So with the old CPUs out and the new CPUs in, it was actually time to start up the server and see the, if the firmware flash had actually worked. At first I tried it on this desk, but it was making so much noise that I decided to install it in the pantry again. After I made sure it was outputting a signal, a video signal, fired it up there, let it run for 
one day, then recorded the last bit of the video also without any audio. Let's have a look on how this server is performing right now. And it's been running for almost three days now, two days and 22 hours. And this is what 20 cores and 40 threads looks like. Yeah, so um, it actually feels like an upgrade because I came from uh, two times eight cores and 16 threads. So uh, 16 cores and 32 threads in total. And yeah, I got a couple of cores extra and a couple of threads as well. Now it's not doing all that much in the background, although almost all my dockers are started and in use of course uh, but only one virtual machine and that virtual machine isn't doing anything at the moment let's have a look at the power consumption of this server uh, what you see in the background is the power meter within ILO and it's been measuring for the last 24 hours let me get my webcam out of the way yes like that 156 watts for the last 24 hours on average with a maximum of 243 watts and a minimum of 146 watts yeah the average is what counts here. This is what the server is consuming for most of the time it is running. Now with the 2450L CPUs, it was almost the same. Um, the difference was so small between the old and the new CPUs that I don't have any regret of upgrading to these new ones. And I didn't even mention um, where I got these CPUs. I got them from AliExpress. So from China and I paid 52 euros uh, for them each so 104 euros in total I find that a great bargain for these CPUs and hopefully they will last for a couple of years but how is the performance with my virtual machine that was actually not all that great in the previous video some of you thought that I was using the VNC connection and that it was uh, because of that that it was so slow um, that wasn't the case when you saw it go in full screen mode in the previous video uh, that's when I switched to a remote desktop and with that it was uh, slow as well. So um, if we have a look on the performance now, you can see there's a little bit of load, but it's not doing all that much. Uh, some programs in the background, I don't have an active internet connection now, I see, no, doesn't really matter. Um, memory, still eight gigabytes and cores, well, I lowered it to four cores and eight threads in total. And we can have a look at the startup times of this, of this VM. So let's power it down, gonna start it up and see how that goes. Now it's powered down, yes. And we're gonna start it again. First, we have to refresh our browser, yes. Let's start it again and we're gonna pick it up again. Connect. And let's see how long that takes. As you can see, it's still not as fast as a bare metal uh, installation of Windows 10 on the SSD. But to me, it's a great improvement of what I came from. Yeah, that's certainly doable. And um, yeah, I can work with that. Um, let's pick it up with a remote desktop and see how that goes. And that will be this one. Yes. Performance. Close that one. Yeah, during the startup, it has a rather high uh, CPU usage and then it goes to idle and well, it's not all that high. No. Uh, memory usage 2.7 of the eight gigabytes, but uh, what's most important Minimize that one. As you guessed, this is my main Windows 10 VM. <laughs> so we go to Explorer. We don't have any website we can browse to, but it, it, it feels snappy. It's workable and I can live with this. It's uh, definitely uh, way faster than uh, with the 2450L CPUs. Probably the base clock speed um, was bottlenecking uh, this VM performance. Now I find it quite interesting why ESXi handles this uh, much better uh, on lower clock speed CPUs than Unread does on the, virtual, on the virtualization side. Now I must admit I wasn't running any dockers on ESXi, but even when these dockers weren't running and I only had one virtual machine running in the background, um, it was still very sluggish and it wasn't a great experience. So um, if it's not a great experience, I won't use it. I, I would rather uh, run a virtual machine on my workstation. 
to be honest. But yeah, that's that's not that convenient to use, um, especially not in your home lab setup. And for that, I want this server to be beefy and perform really well, but I don't want to spend a couple of thousands on a new server. To be clear on that, yeah. So I think this is probably the best performance I can get out of this rather old server, a Gen 8 DL380E with CPUs that were released now in 2014. Yeah, it has some newer CPUs. It has 64 gigabytes of RAM. Hopefully this will last for a couple of years to come. And um, I must say, I'm quite happy with that. Uh, with that being said, I will leave the video at this. If you have any comments, suggestions, maybe some advice, please leave them down at the comment section. Thank you all for watching and see you in the next one. Bye.